Hey, I want to invite you guys, if you've been listening to this podcast and enjoying this content and are passionate about protection, you should know that we have an entire library of all of the protector symposiums that we've ever done uh, hosted at protectornation.com. You can go there and you can download those and you can watch every protector symposium we've had to date there online and you can learn protection tactics from the most, some of the most elite trainers in the world from the comfort of your own home. I think you'll be surprised about how much content we actually have there. Uh, It's very, very, very reasonably priced and you can upgrade your protection skills. Remember, protection is not all about the hard skills. 90% of it is all about the software, the programming, the way you see and move in the world to achieve a safer pattern of life. With that having been said, go to protectornation.com, join us there, and learn from the best of the best. Now, enjoy the show. Boom, hello and welcome to the Protector Nation podcast, a podcast that is dedicated to making the world a better place, making the world a safer place by making good people dangerous. In this podcast, we're going to study and understand what it takes to protect, to protect your family, to protect your loved ones, because we all know that you have a few basic needs, food, water, and shelter, but you also have the need to protect those things in a world and society where evil runs rampant and is sometimes left unchecked. Learning how to protect yourselves and your loved ones is becoming more and more important. And so we strive to raise the level of accountability to those who would do evil on this planet by making sure that the sheep, that the flock, is more well versed in protecting themselves and their loved ones. If that sounds interesting to you, then sit back and enjoy the show. Out. Oh, what's up, you guys? Welcome to another podcast, man. I'm, this is there's so many good guests I want to put on both podcasts, but I have here uh, an honored guest, someone I've known for. a while. Oh, we got to mix it up a few times out there at SHOT Show and different things like that. A well-respected individual in our community as well. Um, Matthew Thomas, he is second in command to Sheriff Lamb out there at Pinal County. How you doing, brother? I am doing good, Byron. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think uh, I think if I remember right, I we were at a little party together in uh, in Vegas. That's where we first met. And, mm-hmm. and I knew right then, I said, this sexy dude right here, I <laughs> hear and he's my kind of people. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, man, I appreciate it, man. And that and they they say things like game recognized game, but I remember when I was hanging with you guys, I was like these are some real dudes, man. These are good dudes. And then of course the relationship took off from there. So, um and also, you know, it's just when you see other guys you know and respect, respect each other. You just know who you can call when things go down and when you need help, man. And that really really matters for a lot, man. So, yeah. Obviously, you've got a savage background. Um, but I want to also mention, so we're going to be talking about uh, in this episode, you know, what what my man Matt's dealing with down there at the border, you know, and and around where he's working um, cartel stuff, his new book, uh, A Lifetime of Service. I mean, he's been on all the teams and and been in a lot of the different positions that a lot of us aspire to be in and want to know more about out there in the game in Arizona. So this is going to be a really, really good one. And your new book real quick, just a little, just give them a taste of the magic. <laughs> a little taste of the magic. It's uh, it's called interceptors, interceptors, the untold fight against the Mexican cartel. And uh, um, essentially the title comes from the fact that a lot of what we were doing is out in the middle of the desert, middle of the night, under night vision yeah. stuff, uh, you know, intercepting loads, intercepting vehicles. And, uh, not a lot of people know that it goes on or knew back then that it was going on. Um, and there's a lot of good dudes and uh, good gals out there doing good work that nobody really knows about. So I kind of wanted to pull the curtain back a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, also wanted to honor the good people doing the good work, you know, and, and let people know that why they are protected yeah. the way they are. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome, dude. I mean, there's been a lot of, um, you know, something I've observed being a combat veteran and spending time in Iraq, you know, I know you get a lot of thank you for your services being a veteran and people are like, oh, you went to war and it's so hard. And yeah. Like, you know, it was, it was war and it sucked, you know, but like there are dudes down there whipping it on with these cartels that are getting after it, that are trading rounds, getting into more stuff than a lot of us got into overseas, you know, like just really living the life. And 
I think one of the luxuries we have in the military, and this isn't a comparison, but this is just like some understanding that some people might not have. Um, it's pretty cool that I got to leave Iraq in Iraq. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I still do my stuff in the protection world and stuff, but like that was the one thing that I always had a lot of respect for officers is like, man, you you're working like a couple cities over, like you're in Walmart, just kind of hanging out with your fam, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, um, what you, you never really feel that way, right? Or and I think none of us do, right? None of us really feel like oh, uh, we're the shit, you know. Um <laughs> But you never really realize that kind of stuff. And I was talking to a, a Navy special warfare dude that I knew. Yeah. And I was just, you know, I was relaying to him the respect level that I have for for dudes like you and dudes like him that get dropped off in foreign nations to do work. And he kind of echoed the same sentiment that you're just saying. And he was like, bro, I come home and switch it off. And I'm at home and I'm not worrying about that stuff. And he says, you dudes yeah. live with the enemies <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah. yeah get up every day and your family has to deal with that. And I know from, you know, my undercover days, my yeah. family suffered most through that. You know, my wife having to, I mean, think about this, having to have a plan when you go to the grocery store to right. break contact and to uh, not only break contact, but a regroup point. So the wife knew break. If I break contact, that means complete silence. You go one way, I go the other then we regroup and we get a rally point and get back together when we know it's safe to do so again, just to keep your family safe while you're doing the job, you know? Just to keep your family safe, guys. Like to keep your family safe, man. That's heavy, you know, that's heavy. And much love and respect for that, man. I want to ask you a little bit about the undercover stuff you can talk about too as we get down range in this interview. Um, but yeah, man, there's just nothing. There's nothing. Me and my buddies were kicking it around the other day and there were some families that were in danger. And I was just like, man, I've been a combatant for a while, but it's never crossed my mind to endanger anyone's family. You know, like, right. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pop off and be like, oh man, you know, I, I want to get this guy or do this or get these kids out of here or whatever, you know, and you'll be thinking about what you're going to do to your enemy. But I just, for the good guys, that doesn't even cross our minds doing right. what they mean, I know. you know, something to even your worst enemy's family, man, that just gives you a, some of you guys a glimpse into what evil really does truly exist and operates daily in this world. So thank God for dudes like you, man. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, it's sure. And you know, in these days, uh, as we've seen over the past couple of years with all the, the media blitz and bullshit towards our profession um, mm -hmm. it's become more prevalent, right? We, we have been hunted more than we've ever been hunted by our own people. And uh, so wow. it's, it's more and more. And, and that's one of the, uh, I can tell you when I first started this career, yeah, worried about running into a bad guy here and there, but it wasn't at the forefront of my discussions or worries these days. It is absolutely like if I go out to empty the trash, I'm strapped. Because oh, yeah. you just don't know, man. You don't know. People are trying to target us for no apparent reason other than I do the job. So yep. it's, it's a weird world we live in. Yeah, man. Not the uh, battle space is always evolving. Real quick for everybody, too, man. So background, experience, you know, all the what's your background, man? We'll be doing it at Shot Show here in a few minutes, you know. <laughs> hey, bro, uh, yeah. what's your background, you know? Hey, man, this is just like rolling into a new pod in the jail. I got to give my papers and, and uh, yeah. get my pedigree. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, That's awesome. So uh, back in 93 is when I started with, with the county. I've been with the same agency now coming up on 30 years in April. Um, wow. So I started here working in our jail, um, our county jail, and then uh, just under a year in there and uh, went out to what we refer to as going out to the road. So I became a deputy sheriff, went through the academy for that, uh, went out to work and, and I've done uh, patrol as a deputy, I did patrol. I did uh, what's called traffic, which means uh, taking fatal accidents and doing DUI stuff. Um, then I went undercover as a detective, worked undercover as a detective, um, and then I got promoted. And uh, while I was promoted or promoted into sergeant, and as a sergeant, I uh, worked traffic. I did motors. I went back to undercover. Um, and then from 97 forward, I was uh, part of our SWAT team, which is a collateral duty team. So uh, part time, essentially, and uh, started, you know, as a baby operator on there and worked my way up to team leader as a sergeant. And then uh, when I got promoted, then I got promoted in 2010 to lieutenant. And uh, when I got promoted, I got promoted into the SWAT narcotics anti-smuggling areas. And that's what I was holding uh, command over. 
And uh, I so I took command of our SWAT team at that point and uh, ran that, ran the undercover stuff. Um, and then in uh, 2016, Sheriff Lamb won the election and uh, he reached out to me and offered me this position to be his second in command. And it was a no brainer because if you know the guy, you know, he's an absolute solid, solid. dude and a yep. solid boss to work for. So uh, I stepped up and I've been in this position here as his second in command since uh, 17 and got a couple more in me and then I'm going to call it good and punch out. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. No, that's what's up, man. Awesome. And what's it, what's it look like now? Kind of your tasks in that current position. Oh man, let me tell you, it's rough because uh, there's paper cuts and uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, for guys like us, that is rough, man. Like that, the office can kill your soul dude, sometimes, you know, dude, if you're not is, ready for it. That's legit. And so, I it was a hard transfer. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, uh, because yeah, man. I was going 100 miles an hour. Um, you know, yeah. um, I I can tell you this. My my wife appreciated the change of pace because yeah. I've, I've, this is the first time in my career that I've been on daylight hours where, you know, I'm, I'm functional during the day and sleeping at night, like normal people. Um, so <laughs> the wife, the wife digs that, uh, but it, it yeah. kind of takes a piece of your soul away because you feel the urge to yeah. still be a cop and still be out there. Um, yeah. so, but I, you have to transform your mind. You really do. And, and you, yeah. you have a, and I think you have evolving epiphanies, right? And so yep. I realized early on when I started promoting, there was two reasons. I wanted to be ahead of some of the idiots I was looking at next to me. And yeah. I wanted to have more influence in what I could change. And so uh, that was with this position. That was one of the driving factors is, man, I could influence so much change uh, in a position like this and all the positive stuff that I had in my mind and all the negative stuff I've seen. Right. Because I've learned some of my best lessons from. I think bad leaders more than good leaders and yeah, so, man. Uh, used all that to kind of push forward into this position and, and go all in. But I can tell you, I am not operational. Um, I, <laughs> I go out every once in a while with the the, yeah. like, the gents just to, to hang and be around real cops. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an office job. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I dig it. I'm glad you said that. And I'm glad, I'm glad you said a lot of those things, but when you're talking about having to restructure your mind, man, that's big because um, I know it's something that a lot of us going through transition have to deal with transitioning out of the military, transitioning into home life, life because of an injury and it claims lives, man, you know, and it's, it's, that's one of the, that's what I wrote my book about finding meaning after the military was just that transition, man. Cause it, it's a war. It's like another type of war, you know, and oh, yeah. a man yeah. without purpose will give in to, uh, to, to pleasure, you know, and all these different things. And then you look at yourself after a while, if you do give in, cause you don't have that purpose, um, and you don't recognize yourself anymore. And then the atrophy of identity can set in all these things, man. So yeah. I'm glad you addressed that. And that's really, in my opinion, what it comes down to, dude, Rest find your new fight, restructure yeah. your mind, uh, and step into the, the new, more relevant battlefield you yeah. know, with honor. Yeah. And you, you, I think you really, you have to treat it like uh, almost like pro ball players, right? And you want to, yeah. you have to pick the right times to make the right moves and you'll feel it, man. And, you know, yeah. I kind of felt it. And uh, one thing I recognize is, dude, you can't fight just age, man. And, you know, as, as much as my mind thinks mm -hmm. that I can hang with these 20 somethings, I can't. Yeah. Dude, they're on a whole different yeah. level. They operate faster than I do. Their minds are quicker than mine. Yeah. Um, and so you have to realize that and you have to realize, OK, if I can't do that as good as them, because then I become a detriment. What can right. I do to help that fight still? And that's where you step into these roles. Heck yeah, man. I love it. That's 100 percent appropriate, man. That's good stuff. And um, no, I love everything you said there. The uh, and oh, that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of it is around also, you know, that's the thing to aging well. And for those of you guys that are still in your twenties and it's time to hammer, remember, man, it's it's the deeds you do now um, mm -hmm. that are going to really contribute to the legend and the honor that you're able to, you know, hopefully deserve one day when it is your turn to kind of take a take a back seat and chill out and run more of the admin side of things and make sure the guys got what they need to do what they do. You know, like the dragons you slay now, man, they, they matter, you know, and yeah. that's oh, to your yeah. glory in this life, man. Absolutely. Stuff. To, that, to that point, man, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. And, and first I want to say yeah. 
absolutely true because what I have found, my purpose in life now is to make life easy for all of my people. So whatever I can get them, however I can do it to make it easier for them. When they say we need this equipment and this is why, cool, let's get it done. Uh, because what I've found in the past and even currently, there's a lot of people that sit in positions like these that they say no because, A, they don't understand the problem and they don't want to admit that. Or yeah. it's just the easy yeah. answer for them is just to say no because they don't want to deal with it. And that's not my gig, man. I'm here to say yes or let's figure out a way. And if I don't yeah. understand it, help me understand it so that I know why you need this, you know, to yeah. get in the fight. But with that, what I want to explain to people is the odds were completely against me my entire life. I have been told my entire life. I grew up in Section 8 housing with a single mom who Heck was yeah. to make it on her own, yeah. uh, grew up in gang infested area. And wow. uh, everybody was always telling me my whole life what I was not going to do and and how I could not be this, not be that. And mm-hmm. that always drove me to keep going and, and go harder. Um, yep. And your point about the hard work and the, and the dragon slaying in your, your younger years, that's what I was about. I was about work. I just wanted to work. I wanted to do good things and I wanted to fight bad people. And uh, yep. that's all I did. And how I got this position People always ask me, were you friends with Mark Lamb before you got this position? No, mm-hmm. I I dealt with him basically one time when he tested for the SWAT team as a deputy and uh, he failed one portion of the test. Therefore, he was out of the test. Mm-hmm. And so I pulled him in, notified him of that. And that was the longest conversation I ever had with the man until <laughs> he contacted me to ask me if I would be his second in command. Wow. So I asked him how did you come to me? Like, why are you asking me? Cause we don't have a relationship. Right. And yeah. he said, everybody I've talked to says, you're the guy for the job. And it was based on my work ethic, my work street product credit. and, and the, the street cred. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, that's good stuff. Gentlemen, take notes. That's awesome, man. And it's, it's a beautiful path. You know, I think there's a lot, <laughs> we're, we're running all kinds of rabbit holes down, but this is good stuff, man. This is the good stuff. Yep. It's a beautiful path for, you know, when I was younger, I was raised in like a real Christian environment. And, um, and I was always kind of, I was always looking for a path to be a warrior. I just knew I was a warrior. My dad's a warrior. Like I just knew that. And I was always like, is there a good path for a warrior? You know? And everyone was like, be nice. Jesus loves you. And I was like, yeah, I know. But like, there's more stuff in that book. I know there is, (laughs) you know? And um, then, you know, the Marine Corps really helped me find that path. And I, sometimes I lament even for dudes that have, you know, maybe done something wrong in their past and it stops them from being able to step into some of the other opportunities. I'm like, man, he may have made a mistake, but that I feel like that's a good dude. And 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 I was probably one step away from like a a fight at school, being in a bad spot. But there's a good path for warriors, man. If you guys are looking to serve, warriorship is a high level of service. Yeah. It's a level of service, a way to serve the pack, serve your society, serve your culture. It's an elite level of service. You know, like you have to train. You need to be good enough to be able to do it. And I love listening to your story, and especially the part where. Yo, we I'm from the camp of no excuses, man. Yeah, you know I mean, like, yeah, you're black, win anyway. You're 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 orange, win anyway. Section eight housing, one parent, no money, win anyway. That's Nobody right. cares. All that matters is what you can achieve. So win anyway. And there's a million people that have done a million more things with less than you got right now, especially if you're in America. So win anyway. <laughs> I love it, man. That it's an honor. Right, man. Yes, dude. Good stuff, man. Yeah. So go ahead. No, on the uh, on the undercover stuff, man. What is that world like? I don't often get to speak to guys on here who have that experience. You know, can you um, tell us a bit about that? And I can. So, usually, what I tell people to give them the, the clearest understanding is it's like the coolest acting job you've ever had, but you can die <laughs> if you get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> so, uh, man. Cause, cause you're on, right? I mean, you really are acting. Yeah. You have an assumed name, you have an assumed identity. Uh, wow. They think you're somebody else. You're in their world operating. Um, but it's, it's the coolest form of police work, man, because when you take off the uniform and, and again, I, I kind of gave you my background where I grew up I, um, and you'll, oh, you'll yes. read in the book. You kind of had a hood background. So that may yeah. give you an edge. Yeah. And that's that's uh, actually how I got recruited into undercover. So when I was I was a a young, tight uniform, high and tight haircut. Yeah. Dress right. Dress. 
Oh, dude, yeah. I was, and you know, when I was on traffic stops, it was sir and ma'am and night pans and shit. Freaking squared away. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. So I looked every bit of a cop. And uh, back in those days, uh, how it worked out is the uh, the narcs would recruit you uh, based on what they were looking for. So I get pulled in and recruited. And I'm like, you guys see me, right? Like, you see how I look? And they're like, bro, we can ch- change how you look. It's It's your heart and how you think. And uh, so the street background definitely helped me because they knew I had an understanding of that. And uh, yeah. that definitely helped in the undercover world, especially that time, because we were dealing with a lot of uh, gangsters and a lot of cartel stuff. So it all it helped to know how to navigate all of that, especially as a white guy, mm-hmm. uh, because you're you're odd man out in that world sometimes and you have to know how to navigate those waters. And uh, yeah. so it was it was cool. Um, and it was, uh, again, you're getting in their world. And so it makes you, when you get out of that and you go back to doing street cop stuff, yeah, so much better because you see things that you just, it's almost like taking the red pill, man. You know, yeah. you see things <laughs> that you didn't see before and you're just yeah. so much better at doing your job. Wow, man. Cause you can see you, you're speaking the language, you know, all the cheat codes, you know, where they're hiding the stuff, you know what you would do if you were in the car with them. Like, you yeah, know, all the stuff. yeah, exactly. You know, That's, all that stuff. And then, you know, cause you do so much surveillance and, and people, I mean, undercover sounds sexy, but I'll be yeah. honest. It's a lot of surveillance. It's a lot of hours of doing nothing. It's a lot of paperwork. You get yeah. maybe five, 10 minutes of action where you're doing deals and, and doing some hand to hands and all that stuff. And yeah. uh, it's a lot of work behind the scenes for that. But uh all and Gatorade that stuff, bottles. Yeah, yeah. Gatorade, <laughs> Gatorade bottles, bottles sure. though. Gatorade you know, bottles. There's a, a few dudes that were Pepsi <laughs> bottles, but we won't talk about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. We Gatorade <laughs> bottles out here. Anyway, that's what's up. Yeah, you, you, uh, you get to basically watch patterns of behavior. And uh, you get to watch it unfiltered because people act different when I show up in a uniform. And so mm-hmm. that behavior looks different. So when you're working undercover, you get to watch patterns of behavior that you won't see when you're in uniform and you get to cue in. All right. I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what that is. And so you can watch the world around you and pick up things that you weren't picking up before because people act different when you show up in uniform. So Mm. that was one of the best advantages of working undercover is you just sit there and watch the world and uh, just pick stuff out. All right. I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. When the other thing too, man, I, I think as a, a huge takeaway for guys, if you're, especially on the EP side of the house, if you want to understand how to do like um, surveillance detection, just do surveillance for a while. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you'll start to kind of realize like where you just, where people need to be, what's going on, what stands out like, and it makes you a lot more aware as yeah. you're moving through the game, man. If, if you know what you would do and how hard it actually is. Yep. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you want to talk about some of the some of the toughest surveillance I ever had was in southern Arizona. Yeah, and, you know, you've been down in Tucson, you know that area. That's some of the toughest surveillance I've ever done, and and rolling surveillance. So you're having to switch cars and 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 handoffs and all that yeah. stuff, and man, it's tough. And uh, yeah, you do. To your point, man, you learn real quick what you can and can't do, what you're looking for, what you're not looking for, and then the weird thing is it carries over to normal life. So you know, I'll, I'll pull into a, a grocery store parking lot and I'm like, why is there two dudes sitting in that truck right there and they haven't got out yet? And so then you start looking for other stuff and yeah, it's yep. crazy. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's wild, man. What would you say, you know, what are some of the things you guys deal with down there in Pinal County specifically that people should know about? I know we can't really depend so much on our our major news outlets, God bless them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, What's the, the problem, battlefield? The problem is everybody like has a uh, everybody has an agenda these days. So without without yep. agendas attached to it, I'll tell you, um, we we just had a pursuit this morning. We we average about a pursuit a day right now. The big thing right okay. now is bodies, right? So back with, yeah. when you read the book, you'll see that dope, marijuana, heroin, uh, meth, cocaine. You know, that was kind of the stuff we were dealing with back then. Um, that commodity has switched. And of course, now we're seeing a lot of fentanyl, mm-hmm. uh, but bodies are the main commodity. So they're shipping bodies up like nobody's business. And if the you think about it, it's a, it's a good market strategy for them because if you're shipping fentanyl, that has to get from point A to point B for payment. If you're shipping bodies, they are paying 
prior to leaving. So they're paying the cartels in Mexico and then they're coming up. So if they get lost, they get in- intercepted. No, no harm, no foul. Cartel got their Still money. Their money. Yeah. So, so that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. So it's the traditional smuggling routes that we have. So just to give people an idea who are listening and don't know the demographics and, and the uh, landscape here yeah. um, for our County, why our County is a key piece of real estate for the cartels is if you take the southwest part of our county and go directly south towards the Mexican border, it's about 60 to 70 miles of open desert. And where it hits the Mexican border, there's some fence, some barbed wire, some Normandy barriers, some open desert. So it's pretty wide open for them to cross and use those areas. And what happens is when they cross in those areas and they push forward north into the uh, U.S. interior, and come up towards our county just because of the landscape, the, the mountain ranges, it kind of funnels them right into our county. And so all of the pickup points tend to be around the Interstate 10, Interstate 8 interchange area, and all along there, that's where they end up uh, getting picked up, either bodies or dope. And so that's what mm-hmm. we're constantly chasing down there. Wow. Interesting. Are you guys able ha- does it feel like you guys are able to make an impact on the flow of bodies coming through? Are you guys able to be effective on the different crimes you're trying to fight down there? How's it, how's it feeling? So right now, (laughs) no, uh, (laughs) because it's very dependent on the federal government doing their job. Uh, And and that's not a political statement. I'm just, I'm talking factual. Who's in the white house. if, If border patrol and Homeland security are allowed to effectively do their job, then yes, we can make an impact. And we have made an impact in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when policies change that inhibit that, then no, we don't, we're not effective at all. And and right now it's finger plugging in a large dam that is leaking more and more, man. And so it's, it's getting tougher and tougher. Uh, it's, It's really, the system is overwhelmed right now. And that's the problem. And that's the reality. Yeah, man. Now that's what I've been hearing talking to some of the border patrol brothers that I have oh, out there, man. Yeah, those dudes are hating life right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, man. Yeah. Um, it's like having your hands tied, and, you know, and still being in the ring, kind of. Yeah, I mean, just uh, imagine, uh, I, you know, for your war fighters out there, just imagine them, you know, running you in and and dropping you out of a plane and telling you, "All right." Go fight the war. All right, where's my gun? No gun, dude. Just go fight. <laughs> just go fight. Yeah, exactly. Like do Not something. Cool. <laughs> just just go do something. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, that's tough. Do you how are have you seen kind of crime and different things pick up as a result of these, you know, not being able to be as effective and different things like that? So how's it looking? What's happening is um because you know, criminals are all opportunists, man. Right. And, uh so what's happening is the crime is shifting. Um, okay. And so what you're seeing with the with all the bodies coming up, what you're seeing is those people being exploited more. So they're they're being wow. raped more. They're being extorted more. They're it turned into the sex slave industry. You have yeah. unaccompanied minors and we know exactly what is happening with them when they get up here. You know, you're talking about mm. seven and eight year olds that have no family with them whatsoever. Predators are everywhere. And wow. so. The, yeah, and like you talked about, the battle space uh, constantly changing, evolving. Yeah, that's that's what we're seeing is is they're just there's all these crimes against people now that are taking place that were not there before because the people were not there before. So when drugs right. are being transported, it's a whole different game now that it's people. It's wow. There's victims that's, everywhere, and the victims essentially they're trying to stay off the radar too. So they're like the perfect class yes. to victimize essentially. Yeah. yeah. Because they don't want to go to the law to say, yeah. Hey, I was victimized because they know they're breaking the law also. So yeah, it's wow. a, to catch 22 for them. Wow. So there's just, it's like an underbelly of everything going on down there. Yeah. Cartel activity, man. I know you wrote about this in your book, but yeah. what is it? What do we need to know about that, man? You just, you really <laughs> need to know that. I think There's the lot, biggest thing sure. that, yeah, there is a lot. I mean, there's, that's like an onion, man. We could just keep peeling back layers all day long. But um, again, I have uh, my my wife is Mexican and her family uh, came from the, the Chihuahua area. Um, and uh, she's had family on her side extorted and killed by cartels. Um, wow. 
But uh, I, I tell you that piece to, to give you an understanding that uh, I've watched the Mexican culture and the country itself degrade with mm. the uh, cartels as they've gained power. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's what people don't understand is that uh, not only are they a powerful criminal organization that's worldwide, I mean, they're connected all over the world, um, but they are vicious. They are very ruthless and evil. And uh, mm -hmm. they have corrupted essentially an entire culture. And you you have a thing, if people don't know, there's a thing mm -hmm. called narco culture. So they have created their own culture within the the cartels. And it's the it's the fast money, the gold AKs, the Lambos, the Tigers, the hot women, the mansions. They're living hard, they're living fast. They're killing each other. They're chopping off heads. They're skinning people. Uh, anything you can think of, they're doing to each other. And it's an all-out war down south of the uh, the international border. And the the cops down there are losing. The military is yeah. losing. The government's losing. And so cartels really hold control. And you can see it. I mean, if you pay attention, you can see it. When you see you see these small Mexican pueblos where it's just normal people living. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden you see a caravan of SUVs come in and just take the town over and start wow. executing people because they're looking for one individual. And then they just leave carnage behind and wow. go about their business. Um, that's what they're dealing with down there. And those people operate on both sides. Like they're not mm -hmm. just staying in Mexico. They operate on this side as well. There's been cartel dudes spotted captured in las vegas spending their money yeah. living the big life you know um so these guys are all over the place and uh they're dangerous 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 and they they are in every town america so if, if anybody thinks they don't have cartel in america they're absolutely wrong now yeah. it's not gonna look like like it's not gonna be your pablo escobar walking around every town in america right but right they have such a an elaborate structure that's much like a corporate organization but they right. have players all over, man. And uh, wow. it's everywhere. Interesting, man. Would you say the cartel is like an American problem now? Like, is it something that was really impacting that we should be? Do you think it is something we should be worried about impacting us up here? Because it I, seems like it's spilling over. I know yeah. that they're everywhere. Right. But how would you look at that question? I've always said that you know, dealing with an insurgency in Iraq was an issue, right? Dealing with, uh, uh, a uniformed force here in the U S um, would be an issue, but I've always said that dealing with the cart, like, uh, an insurgency here would be a really big problem, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it is, you know, you, you guys think terrorists are bad, but like, imagine if you, you wouldn't know if anybody was good or bad here in this situation, man. I don't know. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? No, I, I agree, man. And and I think, uh, I don't think we're at alarm level yet. Yeah. Um, because, and again, it's because of U S law enforcement and, and even our military partners that help in that fight. It's because we are able to fight them and we are not like Mexico uh, to that extent. I would say in Mexico, right. absolutely, man. They are they are the biggest problem by far down there. They like failed easily, state status, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for for us up here, they could be the biggest problem if we yeah. continue down this road of, of not supporting your law enforcement, not supporting the not fight against the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. How are how are our gangs holding up? I heard um, I was speaking with another NGO that does a lot in human trafficking, and they were saying, you know, obviously we have gangs and stuff like that, and they're not good people. But our homegrown gangs are a lot less violent, and <laughs> they're they're almost preferred over yeah. the cartels, man, than than dealing with a lot of these guys. But they're losing in a lot of ways in a lot of territories. And that's actually presenting some other concerns. Right. And they're they're essentially becoming puppets of these bigger organizations because uh wow. you know the big dogs come in, cartels come in, and dude, it's that's like the major leagues, you know, compared it's to like a corporate takeover. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and they'll just come in and they'll tell these street gangs you are now doing X, Y, and Z. They're the big dogs on the block. 
And yeah, that's cool that you guys shoot at each other, maybe stab each other here and there, but mm-hmm. we'll like chop your whole family's head off and uh, throw it on a dance floor, you know, of your local club. So how about that? So, I mean, they're just on a different level, man, when you, when you get up to the cartels um, and the, the gangs are still there and the gangs still yeah. have their problems. Uh, but those, I think traditionally, those are all kind of neighborhood based and sometimes yeah. regionally based. But dude, the cartels are transnational criminal organizations, so they are worldwide. Wow, that's 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 legitimate, man. And I think, I mean, it sounds like the best path forward for us here, just to keep the stability here. You know, I mean, uh, I was I had another SME that was talking on the subject, and he said the cartels just figured it out. They're like, if you got more guys, you got more guns. You know, people talk about different types of currency. You know. But if you got more guys and you got more guns, I always say manpower is the number one currency. I was doing a some consultation for some clients and they were like, hey, what happens after we survive? Like the, you know, hits the fan scenario and like, you know, the bomb goes off and we come out of our shelter. Like, what do we do? I'm like, you start a gang. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you start a gang and hopefully right. we're with you and we can help you start a gang but manpower is actually the ultimate currency whether oh, anyone realizes it <laughs> by far so so back when y2k happened well i was just talking yeah. about it. crazy man i was talking to another dude that worked through y2k as a cop so when y2k yeah. happened i was on our swat team we were deployed that new year's eve because everybody was like freaking out that the world was going to end that night because everything was going to shut down and uh, yeah. we, had a, we, the SWAT team, had a, a contingency plan. We're like, all right, if this shit really goes sideways, we have a right. rally point. Everybody head for that. Grab your families. When we get there, that's going to be our stronghold. We're going to regroup. And then, yeah, we're going to be our Figure own. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 100%, man. So for the, you guys listening, prepare your plan and prepare your relationships, man. Improve your network, improve your relationships. That's really the game. And it sounds like the best way forward with the cartel situation is going to be policies that allow our good guys to do their jobs that yeah kind of- that, that you know traditionally um doing this job and just looking historically at policing not only in america but worldwide yeah. if you just focus on letting good people do what they need what to do people. to get rid of bad people then uh everything kind of works itself out we don't we're, we're never going to win right because there's always going to be the good against evil fight but you can right. hold it at bay man and that's really our job yeah 100 percent, man no, I, I dig that are there any like risks you know with civilians going about their like is it kind of the cartels kind of stick to themselves and do their if you're not in the way of their business they don't really mess with you or are there anything that like civilians should be aware of maybe to uh to stay out of their way to look for them what should they do if they see cartel activity? How how does a civilian interact with this equation? And that's a tough question because uh, right? they assimilate well. So you you know you know your areas, right? And it's it's difficult because now everybody's so sensitive about everything. So if I say, right. "Hey, I'm going to go over here to this area and hang out," and somebody says, "Well, you might not want to hang out in that area," and I'm like, "Why?" They're not going to say, oh, because there's a lot of Mexicans over there, because that would sound really racist. But right, if right. They say like, hey, seriously, like that area is heavily populated by um, like Mexican from Mexico, Mexicans. There's a high likelihood like there's some areas here in, in the Phoenix area. Yeah, that it's cartel land, man. Like that's where yeah. they really roam around. And like they may, may not be a direct threat to me. Like I could go into mm-hmm. a restaurant, have a meal. It's the crossfire shit that you always get caught up in. So a hit goes down, some shit goes down, whatever. You're not paying attention and it pops off around you. And all of a sudden yeah. you're an innocent bystander in the middle of their shit. That's the most likely scenario um, for just, yeah. you know, non-combatants dealing with cartels. Um, yeah. You're not, you're not going to know, like, especially the higher ups, you'll never know that they're even cartel. dude. <laughs> right, right. They cover their tracks pretty good. Yeah, man. No, that's, that's a hundred percent. That's something that we've for sure been looking at, especially I had some clients that wanted to go down South of the border a few months ago when they were having, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's speak on that. What do you say to this, you know, the civilians? It's like, I want to go down there. It's going to be fine. I'll just stay on the resort. And I like pulled a country report and it was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, please listen to me. Yeah. The, you know? the problem is this, it doesn't matter where you're at because right. they go there. And so I can tell you the last time I went to Mexico, 
was when I first started undercover and uh, the the uh, place that we were staying at, which is a five star resort. Yep. You know, it's all all good. It's mostly Americans and stuff. Um, and then about eight years later, it was where Macho Prieto, who was one of the head of the Sinaloa cartel, got in one of the biggest shootouts with the Mexican military where helicopters were launching rockets on condos and shit. So you tell me, you know, how safe is that? <laughs> yeah, man. Literally anytime, any place, anywhere, you know, right, you can right. you can find yourself in a party that you weren't invited. You didn't want to be part of, man. Yep. <laughs> and that's yeah. really a lot of it. Well, and, and, then, and I liken it to this, man. When I was growing up, I told you I, I grew up around gangs and shit. We'd be yeah. at a, we'd be at a, a party in the neighborhood, and all it would take was one dude that was considered an enemy to show up to the mm-hmm. party. All of a sudden, that party is a fight followed by bottles, followed by gunshots, and you mm-hmm. have melee. That's all it takes. Yeah. And and you like you weren't even planning on you were just going to go out and have a drink. And then yeah, you just want to like try to talk to some chicks or something. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom, you're in the middle of a gunfight. Yeah. No, hundred percent, man. That and that's the game, dude. What about um? So let's talk a little bit more about your book, man. Um, I like I was saying, I really I'm excited about it. It's going to be good <clears throat> for all of us to get some insight into things we don't get to hear about for right. whatever reason on the news and good dudes doing things, you know, dirty deeds being done in the dark that need to be done, man. So I'm excited about that to learn a little more about what you guys got going on. Yeah. So the 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 book basically, uh, I wanted to lay some foundation again. You know, I'm obviously a white guy. And so yeah. I wanted Which is, to, these days is like a crime or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I wanted to I wanted to lay some foundation because I was going to be yeah, talking man. about Mexicans and the Mexican culture. So I wanted to give yeah. people an understanding of who I was growing up and how I grew up. So I do that kind of in the beginning, get, giving everybody an understanding of who I am and why I can speak to what I'm speaking to. Uh, right. Lay the foundation. Then I go into uh, a little bit of, of my career, how, how it got kicked off. And then I go into the Mexican cartels themselves, how they're structured, uh, mm-hmm. their belief systems, some of the uh, some of the religious beliefs and some of the kind of bastardized religious beliefs that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I go into the operations, some of the operations themselves that we did that are are old enough now that I can you know talk about the actual Classified. actions that we took. Yeah. And so uh, that's it, man. It kind of. Um, starts with the foundation and ends with some high speed, low drag stuff, some cool guys yeah. shit, and hopefully give people an insight into this world and, and give people an understanding of the fight that's taking place right in front of them. Yeah. That they don't even have any idea about man. And I, and that's one of the beautiful, it's one of the beautiful tragedies of like this America that we've created is that like people can go through their entire life without, really realizing the danger that lives all around them, you know, and it's one of the reasons I dig into one of the reasons that I kind of dig into um, those tactical protection reviews, because it's like, you can see violence that happened to people that had no idea. Everyone woke up that morning. No one thought it was going to happen to them. You know, they thought it would ever happen to them, you know, but they're in it. And then we can try to deconstruct it and try to learn from it and see, maybe I can get, I can microdose you with a little bit of trauma (laughs) and then we can slide some learning in there while your brain's still kind of like, Whoa, that was crazy. You know? And my sisters, you know, lived pretty awesome lives. And, you know, I was always a guy being like, Hey, you know, like, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't sit in your car and text, get the car moving. And they're like, Oh yeah. Byron security guy. Like, uh, I'll be fine. You know? And I'm like, come on, listen to me. And I finally uh-huh. was like, yeah, I think I figured it out. Okay. Here's a video of what you were doing, you know? So that's awesome that good dudes have done a good enough job to set a standard and been able to keep people out of it. But um, the reality is, man, chaos is always right underneath the the water oh, yeah. level. Just especially just- nowadays, man, because I can tell you uh, just from this profession, people are more emboldened to challenge authority to oh my gosh, acts than ever before than I've ever seen in my thirty years of doing this. Yeah, uh, and so you know, people who would never have to face being a victim are faced with that possibility more and more and more because people are right. emboldened to become criminals or or at least commit criminal acts. And so you do have to, it, it's, it sounds odd, but you have to be ready and you have to, at least, you don't have to be hyper vigilant, 
Um, right. it, it helps to stay alive, but uh, you right. know, if you're just a normal non-combatant kind of citizen, at least have gone through some scenarios in your mind. What if this, then I'll do that. Because when it happens in front of you, you don't want to vapor lock, man. You want to be able to at least <laughs> get some thoughts off and do something. <laughs> yeah, man. And and people depend on you. You know, there's right. people, if you're an adult, it's not enough just to be good and innocent. You, you should be, you need to be able to protect your stuff. That's, that's in my opinion, a, a right, a responsibility of good people. Oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, without getting too deep into our faith, uh, you yeah. know, I'm a man of faith too, but I think as the Bible says, if, if something happens in front of me and I can take action and I can forfeit my life for another yeah. Dude, there's no greater honor than that. And so why yep. wouldn't you? Yeah, man. Some of you will understand, some of you won't, but that's true warrior culture. That's the servant, you know, that I think that 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 is in the heart of all the good warriors. You know, that's what makes us different is that right. we're here to make contributions. I'm I create, I acquire power to be able to serve on higher and higher levels, to be able to serve my tribes those depending on me, those who may need me that don't even know it. I, we need to be formidable for those moments, you know, and that's, that's beautiful, man. That's the good stuff. Heck yeah. So I can't wait to get through this book. I, I want to ask you if there's a story you can tell us one of the operations on here, but I'll leave that up to you if you want to touch on that or say. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little piece. Uh, Cause it's one of the funny, funny, <laughs> one of the funny pieces to me. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we were doing these operations where we would we would kind of sneak into these areas at night because uh, in in the southern part of our county, open desert, uh, the cartel has what we call scouts. They're up on the hills. They're in these LPOP, so listening posts, observation yep. posts. So they're up in the hills. They're kind of monitoring the area, the valleys, and all that. So we would have to sneak in under darkness, uh, usually in vehicles, sometimes on foot. Uh, so we're in this area. We're kind of set up. Um, there's some chatter on the radios because they have their own radio network. So there's some chatter on the radios. We're listening to all that go on and we're trying to figure out what's happening for the night. So uh, we spend the whole night out there and uh, nothing happens. And so we rally up um, and usually we would rally up just before sun break so that we could we could be out of there so they wouldn't see where we were and where we were hiding and all that stuff. So we go it's a legit to, combat mission. Like right, it's a legitimate right. combat mission. <laughs> right. No, no target indicators. Get out. Yeah, you know, that's it, man. And so we would get to our rally point and just kind of decide, all right, you know, we debrief a little bit and, and kind of figure out, are we going to go eat breakfast? Or are we just going to go crash for the day? And then what's the plan for the next night? Um, so we're doing that. We're kind of debriefing and uh, we're still in the area, but we're not right, right in the hot zone where we were. And so, yeah. uh, I get out to go take a leak and uh, I think I see a dude in all black, but you know, that time of the morning after you're up all night, I'm kind of like, did I just you're seeing see things I, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> did I see what I thought I saw? Mm -hmm. And so I start kind of walking over there and I, I let my guys know. So they're all back here with, uh, in our vehicles and uh, I'm walking away towards some brush and I'm looking, I'm like, man, I could have swore I saw a dude right here. And then I hear what sounds like a jet. And so I'm looking and I'm like, get out of here. Fuck is that noise coming from? <laughs> and so I'm looking for a jet. And as I'm looking for a jet, I look down this farm road. And what it is is two trucks traveling at about 90 miles an hour down a dirt road. And I'm like, fuck, I know what that is. And so I take off running back. It's a load vehicle, two load vehicles coming. So I take off running back to our vehicles and I'm yelling at them, there's trucks coming, there's trucks coming. So we get in our vehicles. Uh, we catch up to these dudes. The chase is on. Uh, we're going through yeah. fields and stuff. Um, so I'll get to the funny part of the story. This is so when you say a load vehicle, this is like a vehicle full of passengers or like. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. No, no. Drugs so or a vehicle full of drugs at that time. Um, okay. so this, this was basically two Ford F-150 quad cabs. And what they do is they re remove all the seats except the driver's seat. So the quad cab itself is packed with dope as, as tight as you can get it in there. The bed of the truck is packed with dope. Usually they would run anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 pounds in, in a vehicle like that. And so wow. we got two trucks with about 3,000 pounds total uh, coming through. With with jet rocket engines attached to the side. Mexican no, engineering. Uh, <laughs> no, no, the sound was actually the four-wheel drive tires going that fast on dirt road made wow. that jet sound it was just you know i was like holy shit gnarly uh, so as we're in the chase with them they kind of break contact from each other i end up i'm in a 
uh, Ford F-150 quad cab and it's root beer brown. One root of the trucks, beer, baby. <laughs> one of the trucks is the same color. It breaks off. I'm chasing the red truck, uh, red Ford. We come to a point where he starts doing donuts because he's starting to try to disorient us. So he's doing donuts, creating a dust cloud. And at one point we, we are coming at each other head to head. And we both kind of, we both kind of dip off and we come face to face driver's seat to driver's seat. And I can see the look on his face because he thinks this is his partner truck. So he thinks it's the other load vehicle and he's yeah. looking at me and I can almost read his mind. He's thinking, what is this fucking white guy doing driving my truck? As we pass by, <laughs> kind of giving me that look. Yeah, um, like, what the? Yeah. So both of us are kind of looking at each other. I'm looking at him like, I got you. He's looking yeah. at me like, how in the hell did you get that truck? And yeah. We spin around and the chase is on. We end up, uh, he ends up, uh, he wrecks out in the desert and uh, escapes on foot. And we, we recover the truck, but we didn't catch him. And then yeah. uh, the other truck they caught out in another part of the desert. But uh, wow. yeah, just, it was a funny moment just having that face-to-face eye contact with, <laughs> with your enemy real quick where you could just see how baffled they are. At yeah. Thing. It was wow, awesome. Oh, man. Yeah. That's gnarly. But, I mean, that's intensity, man. That's the stuff. That's the stuff that's tough to come down to when you're, like, walking to your desk and you're like, all right, well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I'll send some emails. <laughs> yeah. you're right, right. You get those text messages. Did you get yeah. my email? Uh, I know it's Monday, but <laughs> you're like, all right. Okay, it's coming. No, man, that's good stuff, man. I love it. Awesome. Heck yeah. Well, I can't wait to get into this thing. We got a few closing questions, man. That's good stuff. Yeah. What um what would you say is the hardest lesson you've learned in the field doing this work? Humility is probably the hardest really? lesson I've learned. Yeah. Um and the the uh when I say humility, it's it's uh I guess you know, being humble enough to constantly have introspect into bettering yeah. yourself. Um, yeah. because I think the more you better yourself, the better you are for others and the, the better leader you become. Um, if you have true introspect, if you're looking yeah. for what are my flaws and how can I fix them to be a better me? Because as I gained more humility, because, you know, you're young, you're cocky, all that kind of stuff. As yeah. I gained more humility and more introspect, um, I was better to other people. I was better for my family. I was better for the job. So I, I think that's probably the biggest. Yeah, that's huge, man. I love that. I love that you said that. I, I I think it's important that a lot of guys, like I think as young men, we want to be hot. Like we want to be strong. We want to be BA and powerful and all this stuff. But I think that it's very, it's good if we want to put it to good service, but I allow myself to be afraid of arrogance. Like I, I am like, I allow myself because it ruins everything yeah and like the world is so loving because inaccurate confidence is something that in this reality in this matrix gets dealt with <laughs> you know like right it, it, but it but it's painful you know it can be painful lessons that you have to learn so i it, you know i i'm glad you said that man there's so much power in humility and it's and it's really the acquisition of true power it's accurate confidence that comes from being able to look yourself in the mirror and being like okay dude i still got to do this i still got to do that i'm not that good at this or that i think there's also a lot of power in, in like the sister of this is like submission you know like yeah. being able to to honor those who've done it and gone before you and learn and uh with humility add maybe what's relevant you know to you and your life but being able to submit and learn and and <clears throat> these things are really power centers that I, I really hope that listeners and men to come and women to come can really access, you know. Yeah, because I so, think it, it also makes you a much better leader. And and let's let's face it, dude. I'm I'm at a point in my career where I'm what's called a fag, right? I'm a former action guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna try not to use it. Um. <laughs> but with that, again, I, I've done a lot and I've been involved in a lot. And I think without that humility and without that servant's heart, yep, you're not gonna properly pass that on to to the younger generations to make them better than you were. The goal is always for the the student to beat the master. 
And, right. uh, you know, you can't do that if you're, if you're not humble and you're not willing right. to share, you have to really open up yourself and your heart and you have to yeah. share people like, here's why I know that's not the right path, man. Cause I right. made these same mistakes and this is what it resulted in. The good and the bad, man, the good, you gotta be good enough to share the good and the bad. This is good stuff, man. I love it. Uh, what about, um, your proudest moment in the field? Oh man. Proudest moment in the field, dude. That's that's tough. I it probably when when my wife pinned on my badge. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Because I wow. mean, that's it. Really sets in when when you stand up and you guys know this from from doing it in the military. When you stand up and you raise your hand and you swear an oath, that's a moment. But then for me, you know, because the badge is is that represents everything to us. And when my wife pin that on my uniform for the first time that's when it really hits you like this is who i am now yeah yeah the acceptance of a mantle you know representation responsibility all pedigree all the stuff man Everything, all the good man. stuff that's awesome that's awesome a habit that that you would want people to look at that makes them better protectors or better people constant I, I, these exit questions are easy man they're just dude, light questions you know yeah, yeah no, man. No i got like involved. one more and yeah. then we're off the exit <laughs> it's all good um i would say that the what i consider the best habit is is constantly learning um yeah. because uh yeah I, I would say fitness shooting all that stuff but it really learning entails all of that right and so just yeah. the constant strive to be better and to learn because dude, I, uh, I'm a book listener, not so much a book reader, which is Me kind of weird. Both, I, brother. Yeah. I wrote a book, but I listen to books, but, uh, I am constantly, and I'll listen to all different genres, right? Because I, I want to get as much information as I can to, mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, soften my uh, rough edges and, uh, learn as much as I can so well that I can be well-rounded and, uh, and be, the best leader, the best dad, the best husband I can be. So yeah, I, I would say the best habit would be learning. 100%. It's going to improve you in every different component of your life, man. That, that's huge. Uh, we have a saying over here that I throw around at the school, at the league, you know, professional student, man. We're just a pro like, what are you first? I'm a professional student, man. I just, and I, and I don't know. I think one of the beauties of life, right now is that like literally whatever you're excited about like you can just start learning like you just it's like the matrix you can just download videos yeah. into your little mind like i was never that smart dyslexic like all the oh, stuff dude. struggled in school you know like and like when i realized that like i can just put on an audiobook during my drive and like <laughs> maybe become a little better if i can remember two percent of all the stuff i listen to well if i listen to a couple hundred books in the next few years like i can kind of be kind of kind of super dope a little bit oh, like, yeah I can kind of sure, do some stuff you know yeah, sure. i can go watch a youtube video on something i don't know about dude, on my way so home right now <laughs> let me tell you youtube i've got a 14 year old boy right and so you know around your house there's always going to be a problem pop up something's going to happen right and uh, so problem A pops up and I'm like, man, and it's a, it's a kind of a technical problem with, you know, yeah. like maybe a water faucet, something like that. <laughs> and so I'm like, I've never worked on any of these before. And my boy's like, oh, you got to do this, this, and this. I'm like, and how do you know that? <laughs> I YouTube like, it, Dad. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah. Right. yeah, man. Yeah. No, that's the way forward, man. It's not anymore. It's no, no more is it about how smart you are as an individual. Now it's about how well you can utilize the tools available to you. You have right. the information. There ain't no excuses, you know, right. which is beautiful and awesome, man. Um, what has it all? There's a last one. What's it all for, man? When you, when you die, you know, what was it all for, you know, uh, at the end of the day? So for me, that answer is it's, it's about, your legacy. Um, so it's about my name because in this business, that's really what, what you have to so stand out. Like when we have, we have new guys start up, we tell them like, you're going to be judged forever by your name. When people bring your name up, they're going to know that was a solid dude or not so much. And right. so uh, for me, I've always just wanted to be known as a good person, a good cop, yeah. a good father, good husband, 
And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it, man. That's the main stuff, man. Legacy. No, that's, 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 uh, it kind of goes back into what we were telling. And it goes back into what we were talking about when you got the request from Sheriff Lamb. You know, he asked around, word on the street, and that ends up what it ends up being. And it's not even just about, it's about how your name is associated with the contributions you're making. You, right. you know, like right. how you're making people's lives better, how you're dependable when they call you, how you're all that stuff, man. It all, it, it becomes a composite score and a cumulative score over the course of your life. And those people that know you the best, they've been, they, they their opinion really matters a lot. So, yeah. well, and, um, and you know, one thing I always, and this is kind of morbid to say, but uh, I'm sure other people have the same thought. Who's going to show up to my funeral, man? That, yeah. that'll, be a, that'll show you how I treated people, right? And I, yep. so I think about that a lot. Yeah. No, I think about death a lot as well. It's one of my primary motivators. You know, I, I got rocked in Iraq, had that out-of-body experience. And I have the luxury of living life, knowing the types of things that will go through your head when you're dying, like right. knowing how fragile life is and knowing that like, dude, you're going to die. And next time that's happening, if you get to be conscious for like the last couple seconds of this thing, I don't want to be, if I die today in traffic, I don't want to be like sitting there bleeding out being like, oh man, I should have, <laughs> I wanted to be, you know, I went and that's why I said to God, when I prayed to come back i was like and and it was kind of funny too because when i was praying i you actually said i promise if you give me another chance i'll go so hard in the paint <laughs> i was like i would go so hard in life if you give me back let me come back and you know that's how we need to live man that's 100%. right 100 contribution centric as hard as we can that's the good stuff heck yeah well it's been an honor it's been an honor sir this has oh, been awesome honor man is mine, bro. honor is mine i appreciate you Heck yeah, man. So what do you, where can people find you? Where can people find the book? If they want more, all the good stuff. Yeah. So, uh, social media, I am most active, almost exclusively active on just Instagram. Cause that's just, you know, it's too time yeah. to do everything else. And so on Instagram, I'm at deputy underscore one time. And then, uh, I have, uh, have a website, which is one time nation.com. And uh, I got to re-up my supplies there, but they can find the book there. They can find links to get the book, uh, all that stuff. It's on Amazon. It's on all that. So uh, Heck yeah. yeah, that's it, man. Sweet. And then text me the links, all the links. We'll put them in the show notes. Gotcha. One, one last question. One time, where'd that come from? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> if you can share so, with it. If you, uh, if you grew up in a hood, you know exactly where they came from. So uh, <laughs> they, uh, as I grew up, that was kind of what cops were referred to. And and there's a lot of arguments over the origin of one time. But uh, yeah, when when cops would hit the block, that's what would get hollered down. Like one time, one time, one time. So everybody <laughs> would know the cops are hitting the block. So yeah. being a deputy sheriff, I had to have deputy in there because I'm very proud of that heritage. Yeah. And, uh, then one time just went along naturally. So I became deputy one time. <laughs> deputy one time, baby. That's what's up, man. I love it. Yo, this has been good. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for your time and attention, brother. I look forward to hopefully linking up with you at Shot Show. I know you're doing sure. you're doing a signing uh, out there, possibly. Where are you going to be at? Yeah. I'll probably uh, drop this before the show. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where we're going to be boothed up yet, but I know okay. I'm going to be doing one with Vertex Clothing, and I know I see you there nice. all the time. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to be doing another one with uh, one of the gun companies and we're just we're solidifying all that still. OK, uh, but as I get closer, social media is the place to pay attention yep. That's where I'll drop all my stuff on what's going on. And and yeah, man, we'll see it shot for sure. Too easy, brother. Awesome. All right, Matt. Thanks so much. It's such nope. an honor, dude. Thank and uh, I look forward to doing some more cool stuff this year and just want to honor you for, once again for canonizing your experiences and the hard work of those men and women that you've been out there operating with, man, and serving them. I know they're blessed to have you and Sheriff Lamb up there, man. It's an honor. Thank you. Boom. This is my MCK. There are many like it, but this one is mine. If you've got a firearm sitting around, a pistol that you are not doing anything with, get an MCK. They make them for every single model. If you want a micro conversion kit that will turn your handgun into a force multiplier, get one, man. They are ultra affordable. CAA MCK micro conversion kits are the changing the game, y'all. So if you don't have one, you need to get one. Get one, your women, children, people that are less physically potent will be able to fire your firearm to farther distances with more accuracy. 
you will be able to fire your firearm to farther distances with more accuracy. I want to get one of these into the hands of 100,000 more protectors this year because ultimately we are only as good as the things, the nation is only as good as its protection. Your home is only as safe and as good as your ability to protect it. MCK, go get one, drop your handgun in, take it to the next level, out, boom. Boom, yo, what up? I hope you guys really enjoyed that episode. Hey, listen, in order to get more out of the brand, I wanna encourage you to go join us on our social media platforms and join us at protectornation.com. We post different types of content on our different platforms at different times. Uh, you'll get blog posts, you'll get videos, you'll get real world combat engagements and things like that. So stay plugged in in order to get the most out of the brand. In order to support us, also go to protectornation.com and buy something or join forces with me on Patreon. You'll scroll down the homepage and you'll see the link. Uh, anything you can give counts, you know, think about whatever you would lose in your cushions or like spend on McDonald's this month, five bucks a month, whatever it is. Uh, that helps, that helps us make the world a better place by making good people dangerous. Anyways, this is Byron Rogers, protector by nature and by trade. And I'll see you on the next piece of content, whether it's a video or podcast out.